This year, we're marking 70 years of the burial of Theodor Benjamin Zev Herzl in Jerusalem. Herzl is often compared to Moses, Moshe. Though there are similar similarities, it seems to me Herzl more closely epitomizes Joseph. Initially, both of these visionaries believed that assimilation was the best interest of the Jewish people. But quickly, they, became, they realized that this was not the case. They envisioned a home of the Jewish people long before the creation of the, Jewish, of the State of Israel, and the physical remains of both visionaries were brought back for burial to Eretz Israel. In his autobiography, published in the Jewish Chronicle in September 1898, Herzl noted, my earliest memory of school is the beatings I received because I did not know the details of the exodus of the Jews of Egypt. Currently, many schoolmasters would like to beat me because I remember too much of that very exodus. This was just one of the statements in which Herzl discussed anti-Semitism. Another example is a letter Theodor Herzl wrote in March 1896 to Israel Zangwill a British author and Zionist, in which he exclaims, I shall be very glad to see you in Vienna and to make you the honor to the capital of anti-Semitism. On August 6, 18, 1898, he notes in his diaries, Many, my main theory in life is those who want to change people must alter the condition of their lives. My testament for the Jewish people, make your state in such a way that the stranger will feel comfortable among you. Born on May 2nd, 1860 in Pest, Hungary, Theodor Herzl passed away on July 3rd, 1904 in Edlach at the early age of 44. He left behind his wife, Julie, mother, Jeanette, their three children, Paulina, Hans, and Trude, as well as tens of thousands of followers of Zionism. Theodor Herzl wrote three official testaments. He had expected an early death, which we can see already in his first pair and throughout his wills, written on February 12, 1897, during the days of spiritual crisis following the publication of his first book, The Judenstadt, The Jewish State, his vision of a Jewish state. In both wills, Mein Letzter Wille, My Last Will, and my, litera my Literarisches Testament, My Literary Testament, Herzl presents death in his first sentence. Because I believe that my heart is not quite healthy and because it is proper to be prepared for death. He wrote in one and in the other, it is proper to, be, to prepare for death. Now one could argue that the context of a testament is death. And as such, it shouldn't come to a surprise that Herzl mentions it. Especially since beforehand, Herzl's doctor had diagnosed him with a weak heart and Herzl's consistent diary entries suddenly stagnated as well. In a letter to David Wolfson, a close friend, member of the Engeres Aktionskomitee, the Inner Action Committee, and his succeed, successor of the World Zionist or, Organization, he writes, I'm feeling fatigue. He, in the continuation of his literary will, he observes, I do not wish to indulge in meaningless statements what I have been to the Jews will be more properly appraised in the times to come than by the large masses at the present, of the present. Herzl's disappointment can be detected in these comments, though also evident is his self-assessment regarding his personal achievements. Herzl, feeling hurt and tired, was far from being discouraged, as just half a year later, he convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel and ultimately changed Jewish history. 
For the publication of his writings, Herzl detailed direct sorry, Herzl left detailed directions. He requested that his diaries, which chronicled his activities on behalf of the Jewish people and his Zionist texts, were to be released in German and English. His additional writings, such as plays, articles, essays, were to be compiled in various books. One of these collections was to be his feuilletons and articles written in France for the newspaper Neue Freie Presse. If a book was with a selection of plays was to be published, Herzl requested the inclusion of his plays Das Neue Ghetto and the fragment of his comedy Ehe Komödie. He contemplated his literary his literary uh, testament with the statement he completed my name will grow after my death therefore I believe that for each of my works a publisher will be found today as in every moment since I started to write I carry the awareness that I've always kept the pen as a man of honor I was never driven by wickedness nor by companionship. This last will can be published. Even after my death, nobody will be found who could call me a liar. Herzl was raised as a man of honor and achievement by his parents with whom he had a very close relationship. One which grew even closer after the death of his dear sister, Pauline. Only a year senior than Theodore she passed away at the young age of 18. Jacob and Jeanette loved, supported, and encouraged their son in every possible, possible way, which was reciprocated by Herzl himself. His marriage with Julie Naschauer was difficult from the outset. Julie, the intelligent but spoiled daughter of a rich industrialist, suffered from hysteria, jealousy, and had a tendency to exaggerate. Though Herzl's fixation with his mother was not exactly helpful for a wedded bliss either. Theodore Herzl loved his wife, but was aware of her limitation and did not trust her abilities to educate their children or to manage their financial matters. He contemplated divorce, but never acted upon it. In 1890, he wrote to his parents regarding his marriage. I have not chosen well, but she is my wife and the mother of my dear child. The mar marriage further deteriorated after a major disagreement and after Herzl left for Spain alone. With this in mind, the composition of his testament, My Last Will, in 1897 does not come to a surprise. Within this will, Herzl thanks his parents for everything they had done for him. He hoped for an increase in the value of his literary estate and the possibility to reinstate his wife's dowry to his original value. He nevertheless blamed Julie for overindulgence which in his mind which was the cause for the deteriorating financial situation. Herzl appointed his parents to be the guardians of his children. He stipulates that their son, Hans, was under no circumstances to be raised by Julie. Their daughters, Pauline and Trude, would have no alternative other than to remain in their mother's home, in which case he hoped that Julie would recognize the severity of the situation and would become a good example to them. Three years after his original testament on May 23, 1900, Herzl replaced his will with a new version in which he requested a poor man's funeral. I believe it's the fourth, fourth class of the Hevra Kadesha category. In any case, it should be the simplest and the cheapest funeral. Should he die in Vienna, he requested to be, to be buried at the Döbling Cemetery, so his children would have a nice stroll when visiting. 
I wish for a tombstone without any decoration on my grave with the inscription, Dr. Theodore Herzl, son of Jacob and Jeanette Herzl, born May 2nd, 1860, died, and his Hebrew name, Binyamin Ze'ev, in Hebrew letters. Again, he bestows all of his belongings to his parents and children. His wife is to receive the use of fruit as stipulated in Austrian law. Herzl now suggests that Leon, Dr. Leon Keller, a noted scholar and veteran of the Zionist movement, together with Ermin Rosenberger, author and editor of the newspaper Die Welt, should lead the efforts to publish his writings. As the executors of his literary part of his estate, Herzl appoints the Engeres Aktion Committee, together with Moses Schneerer, a veteran Austrian Zionist and founder of the student association Kadima, Oskar Kokesh, a lawyer and one of the first members of the Chovevei Zion, Leopold Kahn, member of the Inner Action Committee, and Oskar Marmorek, a famous architect and also member of the Inner Action Committee. In a separate attached sealed envelope, Herzl leaves additional financial instruction, which may change, he hoped, but would not require an additional will. At the opening of the envelope, he stipulates that only his closest relatives and a po public notary may be present. In the appendix, he manifests the extent of the remains of Julie's dowry, but again, demonstrates his hope for an improvement. He furthermore determines that all children were to receive equal amounts to, of, the, of his estate. In case both parents and children should pass away, all of his property and assets will go to the Zionist movement, either to the Jewish Colonial Trust or the Karen Kayemet. Soon after, on July 14th, he wrote to his friend, Moritz Reichenfeld, a financial advisor who was his wife's cousin and in whose house Theodore had met his blonde and blue-eyed Julie years before. He writes, Dear friend Moritz, my illness last week has brought me closer to the idea of death. When I look around among my friends, you are the one to whom I most entrust the care of the future well-being of my relatives. Therefore, I request you, in the aftermath of my earlier testamentary arrangement, to be the testament executor, in case my father is no longer alive. Also, in case in the, of the death of my father as well of my mother, I appoint you to be the guardian of my children, together with my friends, David Wolfson and Johann Kremenetsky. That is, if my father and mother are no longer alive, you should be the first guardian, Wolfson the second, and Kremenetsky the, the third. By writing this down, I have the impression that your feeling of friendship is as much sincere as mine for you. On November 8th, Herzl reached out to another friend, David Wolfson, but requested that the letter was to be opened only after Herzl's death. Dear friend Fro Wolfson, repeatedly the idea that I will not ling life live long creeps up to me. I exceeded too much of my nerves, but much, had, too, had much excitement, fights, and labors. Death will suddenly overcome me. This thought has nothing terrible for me. I'm ready for it every hour. There is only one thing which weighs heavily on me when the thought of death falls upon me. This is the material future of my children. For years, I have sacrificed too much money for our idea and thought too little about my children. For me, as you know, as you know I never ask for a reward or thanks for my services. In June 1902, Jakob Herzl, Herzl's father, passed away after a stroke. From the diary entry of June 20th, written in Ause, the family's vacation domicile, 
One can feel Herzl's heartbreak from the loss of his blood father. He writes, everything passes over. Now I am back at the desk of last summer. I have nothing from my father and his picture standing in front of me. He is con completely gone from my life. Only his picture tells me how he looked like and that I will not see him anymore. Huh? In 1903, one and a half years before his death, Herzl prepared another will, his last and the only binding one. In it, he names his children as their heirs of his estate. If one of them was to die, their portion was to be divided between the remaining children. His assets, as the, at the time included 1,600 shares of the Jewish Colonial Trust, shares of the newspaper Die Welt, royalty from his book, and one-eighth of the ownership of, ownership of the intellectual property of, the, of a tuberculosis serum developed by Dr. Alexander Marmorek. Herzl requests that his comrades were to sell the, the shares of the trust, but understood that it was premature to sell shares of Die Welt. He hoped that eventually the Congress would be sufficiently successful and that they would be able to pay his beneficiaries the amount due to him. The free use of his estate was to be inherited until her death by his mother. Julie Herzl was to receive a monthly stipend to be determined by his mother. Again, Herzl repeats his desire for the least expensive funeral without flowers or speeches, but also his dedication to, for the Jewish state. I wish to be interred in a metal coffin next to my father and to remain there until the Jewish people will, will transfer my remains to Palestine. Likewise, the coffins of my father, of my sister Pauline, buried in Pest, 1878, and of members of my immediate family, mother and children, should be brought to Palestine. My wife only if she declares in her last will. I wish that my son, Hans, if circumstances permit, be raised in England. My friend, Joseph Cohen, in London, promised me in Cookham that he will take care of it. My children should bear my name in honor, as I have brought honor to it. As the executors of this will, Herzl names notary Sigmund Holding, David Wolfson, Johann Kremenetsky, and Joseph Cohn. After the turbulent Sixth Zionist Congress, which de debated the British offer of a Jewish state in Uganda, Herzl convened the Reconciliation Con Conference of the Greater Action Committee, which turned into one of his last great achievements. Herzl con convinced his opponent of his sincere wish to create a Jewish state in the land of Israel, but that there was a necessity to offer a solution of, to the Jews of Eastern Europe tormented by the pogroms. With the horrors of Kishinev still fresh in everyone's mind, one of his arguments was the following. Here is a piece of bread. I personally have my own piece of bread and may even have cake in addition. Therefore, I do not have the right to reject the piece of bread that is being offered to the poor just because I myself do not want or need it. I personally may be delighted even if in times of misery and famine an answer born of idealism will be given. No, we don't want this bread, but surely it is my duty to ask the people first. Hold on. All of this turbulence weakened Herzl's heart. His doctors diagnosed a change in his heart muscle Okay. Um, and prescribed a six-week treatment in Franzensbad. 
He was aware of the seriousness of his condition, but concealed it from his mother. Despite everything, Herzl never lost his sense of humor and sarcasm. In one of his last letters in May 1904, he writes to David Wilson, don't do anything stupid while I'm dead. Three days later, on May 9th, after a severe heart attack, he said to Nissan Katzenelson, why should we fool ourselves? It's for me the third bell. I'm not a coward and I'm very calmly towards death. All the more, I have not spent the last years of my life useless. I was not a too bad servant of the movement, don't you think? There is no time for joking. It is deadly serious now. The treatment just worsened his condition, and on June 3rd, 1904, Herzl left, Vienna, left Vienna for Edlach in the company of his wife and Johann Kremenetsky. Before his death, he left a piece of paper with the words, in the midst of life, there is death. If we examine these last statements, we clearly understand Herzl's acceptance of his impending death though it seems that he was well aware of the greatness of his vision and achievements. With this in mind, he was at peace. Throughout Herzl's testament, we understand his dedication to his family, the Zionist movement, and Eretz Israel. With Herzl's deep sense of ju justice, he strongly believed not only that a Jewish state in Eretz Israel would be a solution for the Jewish people, but rather to be a powerful example of moral and spiritual perfection for the world with all its faults. Later, his sister-in-law, Ella Naschauer, would say about Herzl, even among his family, Herzl did not want to impose his personal difficulties upon who surrounded him. The problem of his people he grabbed with eagerly. His own problems he would turn over to nobody. Some have interpreted his characteristic as egoism. Obviously, it was pure selfishness. The announcement of Herzl's death generated an outcry throughout the Jewish communities. A tremendous loss was felt around the world. And although his funeral was meticulously organized, Herzl's death had overpowered the emotions of the masses. The famous writer Stefan Zweig remembered Herzl's funeral as per the following. It was a single day, a day in July, unforgettable to those who participated in the experience. Suddenly, from all the railroad stations of the city, by day and by night, from all realms of lands, every train brought new arrivals, Western, Eastern, Russian, Turkish Jews, from all the provinces and all the little towns, they hurried excitedly. The shock of this news still written on their faces. Never was it more clearly manifest, manifested what strife and talk had formerly concealed. It was a great movement whose leader had now fallen. The position was endless. Vienna startled, the, Vienna Stardlet became aware that this was not just a writer of me or a mediocre poet who had passed away, but one of those, cre cre of those creators who, of ideas who disclosed everything, who disclosed themselves triumphantly in, in a single country to a single people at vast intervals. A tumult ensued at the cemetery too many had suddenly stormed to his coffin, crying, sobbing, and screaming in a wild explosion of despair. It was, it was almost a riot, a fury. All order was upset through, through a sort of elementary and ecstatic mourning, such as I had never seen before or since at a funeral. And it was this giant outpouring of grief from the death of millions of souls it made me realize for the first time how much passion and hope this lone and lonesome man had borne into the world through the power of a single thought. After Herzl's death, his children were sent to live with his relatives. 
The Zionist movement called for a collection of funds to support Herzl's descendants. The money raised was then invested in Austrian-Hungarian Empire bonds, which was supposed to assure the family its members a steady income. World War I brought with, the, with it the fall of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and with it the bond became worthless. Julie Herzl passed away three years after her husband. Theodor Herzl's, Theodor Benjamin Zev's, her dream for a last resting place in the land of Israel was fulfilled after his remains were brought to Israel, as Anat before told us, and, and interred on the eve of August 17, 1949, in the outskirts of the Beit Wagan neighborhood. In addition to the leadership, repre representatives of town, institution, and organization from all over the country attended the ceremony. Each carried a blue and white bag of soil from the place they lived, which was later placed on Herzl's coffin. After the recital of the Hilim by a choir, the coffin was lowered into the grave to a drum roll and a chauffeur blast. The ceremony concluded with Kaddish El Malay Rahamim and the national anthem at the Thank you.